The debate over pesticides in Hawaii is again poised to take center stage at the Capitol, now that a state senator from Kona is proposing a bill to regulate how the chemicals are used. On September 18, 2014, three schools in the town of Honoka'a were closed, and students were evacuated when an unknown chemical odor invaded their school. The Hawaii County Civil Defense issued an alert over the radio. The Hawaii Fire Department and Department of Education report that the Honoka School Campus will be closed effective 10.30 a.m. this morning due to a possible hazardous materials incident. Emergency responders are on scene and tending to the students and staff and working to identify the source and nature of the material. On the ground, it was a full hazmat situation. They requested that we respond with the hazmat company and the fire company to uh, investigate it. And as we responded, uh, we got reports of children getting sick and adults getting sick from the smell. A number of students went to the emergency room at the local hospital, Hale Ho'ola Hamakua. We immediately activated our code orange. We were informed that we were receiving five patients to our ER via um, the ambulance. Um, so our hazmat team and our decon team set up this tent behind me to get ready to decon any patients that were coming in. The majority of the symptoms were nausea, headache, um, some chest pains, anxiety, because of the situation. After an investigation into the source, it was discovered the odor came from the spraying of an insecticide at a neighboring home. Which was from a resident who was spraying um, Dazanon and uh, Voke oil. So uh, they talked to the person, confirmed that that was the uh, chemical that was that people were smelling or getting sick from. Diazanon, in fact, was banned for residential use by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 2004, although it is still allowed for commercial use by licensed applicators. The person who sprayed it was unaware of the restriction. I guess he was spraying his yard. Yeah, with the trade winds, I guess the wind, they carried the spray over into the school area, which affected the students. The kids ended up being okay, and school resumed the next day. But the incident was a vivid illustration of safety concerns many in Hawaii have when it comes to pesticides, whether it be insecticides, herbicides, or fungicides, especially those used in the research and development industry. The controversial bill that I'll be uh, pressuring uh, the committees to hear and, and working hard on is a pesticide buffer zone. This year at the state legislature, Kona Senator Josh Green plans to tighten the law. Pesticide free zones wherever children are, around schools and health care facilities. I think it's an important bill and, and even a compromise bill. This is not a, I'm going to be very candid with friends, this is not a ban on GMOs, this is not a ban on pesticides, but it is a buffer zone around any facility where children spend time Pregnant women spend time, individuals who have chronic disease spend time, hospitals, health centers, long-term care facilities, and schools. I think it's the right compromise to bring these two large groups that have been really at war with one another together on behalf of people. It could be a hard sell at the Capitol. Pesticides are linked to the divisive issue of genetically engineered crops. Regulating genetically modified organisms is seen by some as tampering with the right to farm. The use of chemicals is a major factor driving recent attempts to regulate GMOs at the county level. Dr. Ashley Lukens, a program director for the Hawaii Center for Food Safety, explains the connection in this May 2014 video. Uh, Hawaii is the number one uh, field test site in the, in the United States. In 2013 alone, there were 1,124 open air field tests of genetically engineered crops. Compare that to California, a state with much more agricultural land, um, much of it isolated from residential and commercial areas, they had 124. So 1,124 field test sites. The vast majority of that was plants that have been genetically engineered to withstand the greater application of pesticides. The vast majority. And the vast majority of those field test sites 
were conducted by chemical corporations. After Dr. Lucan spoke, biologist Tyrone Hayes, a professor of integrative biology at University of California, talked about his studies of the herbicide altrazine. They asked me if I could look at atrazine and tell them if atrazine <coughs> was a so-called endocrine disruptor. Did it affect hormones? It's an herbicide, it's a weed killer, mostly used on corn, but as you know here, it's also used on sugarcane. It's been used since 1958. So just after World War II, we used 80 million pounds annually in the United States. At the time, it was the number one selling pesticide in the world 15 years ago. It's now number two. We still mm -hmm. use the same amount. We just use more of something else. Hayes says in his youth, he was just a little boy who liked frogs. Now, he believes the use of pesticides is leading to the global decline of amphibians. I firmly believe now that our silent night that we're experiencing right well, maybe not here with the coking. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. I firmly believe, despite what you hear with your coking, 70% of the world's amphibians are in decline. A group of animals, a class of animals that survived the extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs, now 70% are in danger at some level of going extinct. He began as a scientist in the employ of Syngenta, the company that manufactures That's Altrazine. What, like. what you're looking at is control males have testicular tubules, you see them? That are filled with sperm. Atrazine treated males, if you look at their testicular tubules, it's full of debris, no sperm, empty testicular tubules. They don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. So we published another paper. We went back to PNAS. My mom knows what it is now. <laughs> Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in African clawed frogs. You see, the company hates that term, chemical castration. <laughs> That's why I put it in the title. <laughs> That's the kind of brother I am. But after he went public with his findings, he became a marked man. Syngenta saw all of my original data. They owned it. They paid for it. It was theirs. I didn't have a choice. The EPA, by this time, was in my lab investigating. They saw all the raw data. They reanalyzed my data. They saw how we did everything. I sent them this. Hayes was discouraged by the response from the Environmental Protection Agency. And I broke the rule. I sent them the data before it was published. And the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, or insert anything else that starts with an E that you might want, the EPA wrote me back. I sent them an email. They said, Dear Dr. Hayes, thank you. This is a very interesting finding. However, we don't think that this is an adverse effect that would trigger reassessment and regulation of the herbicide atrazine. Here's what the EPA says is allowable in the drinking water, three parts per billion. Might be 200 tonight, but that standard just means that on average over a year, you shouldn't have more than 30 times what we know to be biologically effective and you're drinking water. Today, Eltrazine is one of the most widely used herbicides in the United States. It was banned in the European Union in 2004 because of persistent groundwater contamination. When and how did we decide that there was a difference between environmental health and public health? that somehow we're no longer part of the environment, that we could talk about those two things separately. Altrazine has been detected in 10 of the Hawaii County Department of Water Supply's 22 water wells, mostly in agricultural areas like Hamakua and Ka'u, at levels below the limit set by the EPA. And Altrazine is just one product being used. Senator Green recently held a hearing on the use of Roundup in the islands. A uh, Big Island resident sent me these pictures, and I'll, I'll hold them up for you, which was um, a, a daytime, what looked like a basic routine spraying along the, the side of the road. But it also uh, did, did demonstrate, and someone would have to focus in on this, maybe other people on these slides, kind of a power hose being used along the side of the road. And this is quite near... Uh, well, it's near the center of the population in our powerful metropolis of Kona. Meanwhile, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture has their own approach to the, the issue. The Hawaii Department of Agriculture thinks that the Good Neighbor program is going exceedingly well. The department's chairperson is Scott Enright, a resident of Hamakua. Enright recently testified before lawmakers on the state's Good Neighbor program, a response to the county of Kauai's attempt to regulate pesticide use. Enright says the state does not see a problem with the chemical companies. The, the premise that, you know, was the foundational premise that underlined 2491 
was that there was a problem with, with pesticide usage by the large biotech companies on Kauai. We at the department don't see that to be the case at all. So we're working with the, the public to, you know, take care of any of the concern, address any of the concerns that the, the community has on the west side of Kauai. But we don't see that the pesticide usage issues on Kauai as, as a problem for that community. Enright says the department sees a greater need for educating the general public. You know, there's a, a lot of um, conversation about agricultural pesticide use, but it, it's homeowners. When we've seen schools that have needed to be cleared out recently because of pesticide overspray, it was from homeowners. And, you know, it's our... Um, termite applicators. We need to work with, with everybody that uses pesticides.